So uh, next up is a panel discussion. Yep, so we have uh, some power packed experts uh, from the region who are joining in to uh, discuss how to modernize, protect and manage security with artificial intelligence, zero trust frameworks and stay ahead of uh, involving threats. So we have Mr. Rami Ayub, who is the moderator of this panel. Uh, welcome, Mr. Rami. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you for uh, life, and I uh, welcome all the panelists who joined this summit, important summit. So it's an important summit for us, okay, where we are using a modern technology such as like hybrid cloud and other products, but we need to put the security as a mandatory feature. So today we are moving and live in a digital era where digital products in our life, in daily life. So our information is not now anymore is hosted in one location or in one file. It is spread over and the transaction from between one point to another point. So security is very important to be in the top of that technology to govern this information. As today, you know, information is cost millions Okay, and any threats for that one is a big risk, which impact in the business or any uh, uh, stakeholder. So here we have many questions to be clarified, how security are important in our daily life, how to secure modern technology, such like a cloud, AI, automation, and et cetera. So I would like here to answer this question, I would like to welcome our panelists Okay, from different region who are decent uh, and have uh, long experience in this field. So I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Emmanuel Govi. Welcome, Doctor. Dr. Emmanuel Govi is a co-director and co-founder of a Global AI Ethics Institute. He's also consultant in AI ethics and with Huawei, as well as a REACH fellow with the Center for Defense Security and Studies of University of Manitoba with, in Winning. Welcome on board. Thank you for welcoming me, thank you. And uh, we have, uh, also Madame Halal Gawi, a senior manager, business information and cybersecurity risk in MINAP. She has more than 14 years of experience in banking industry, technology risk management projects, and cybersecurity. Managed several security projects such as PCI, DCS, ISO 27001, NIST, NISA, and COBIT. Welcome on board. Thanks, Rami. And uh, I'd like to welcome also Mr. Shadi Ismail, solution specialist from Citrix MENA. Shadi has over uh, 11 years of experience in IT modernization and optimization, optimizing technology to address key business challenges in banking, telecommunication, government, and commercial sector. A solution architect and sales engineer, also with multiple solutions in the cloud and other areas. Welcome on board, Shadi. Thank you a lot. Thanks for hosting us here. Thank you. Well, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Emmanuel. Doctor, as you are from AI background, uh, today uh, AI, we hear it everywhere, okay, in every location and how important to use AI to streamline our life process, uh, to make our life uh, uh, more easier. Uh, business can be uh, more controlled, uh, reduce the time, the efforts. So, we have many events, many summits all around about AI, okay, and how AI is important to our life. So the question here, is the quest for trust ethically is acceptable in the framework of a, or global code of AI ethics? Well, thank you for the, for the question. Um, uh, you're perfectly <laughs> right about the, uh, uh, the, the presence of AI in our everyday lives today. Uh, the paradox is that uh, to some extent we could consider that AI does not exist per se, right? It's much more kind of a, uh, 
um, I would say, a narrative or uh, a speech utterance uh, because we cannot define what is artificial, we cannot define what is intelligence, so we are not able to define what AI is exactly, right? So we have kind of a slight idea of what uh, artificial intelligence is or can be. So we are all discussing about this new technology and the fact that we do not have a clear definition has opened the doors to many phantasms about the risks and the benefits of, of, uh, of AI. So in that framework, lots of people are really concerned about the risks that are uh, associated with artificial intelligence, obviously, right? Uh, some of them uh, even uh, talking about the end of humankind replaced by robots and, and, and AI systems. Uh, so in that framework, there is a strong need for regulation. Lots of people are saying uh, we need to set standards, we need to set limits to the use, the development and the programming of, of artificial intelligence system. The problem with, with legal framework is that it's a really long process. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes political will. And what we've seen so far is that this political will and this uh, will to uh, put some energy into that is not um, evenly shared in, in the international system. So uh, having this legal framework is really, really difficult. So what we've done and what we've seen uh, for the next uh, five, uh, six, six, five, five, six years is that we have developed a new narrative around ethics, what we call soft law. Right, and ethics is much uh, easier to use than legal uh, system because it's much more flexible and because it does not need to have any kind of legal or, or real framework like uh, an international law or uh, international agreement. So you have the conjunction of, of two things that are really interesting. First, artificial intelligence, uh, which is not clearly defined. We have a slight idea of what artificial intelligence is but we, don't, we cannot define it clearly. And you have ethics, which is not well defined as well, and which is used much more as a narrative than as really a process that we, go, what, that we have to go through in order to assess or appraise uh, uh, ethics. So we've seen that development of ethical standards all around the world. And now we've reached a point where we have more than 1,000 codes of ethics all around the world and most more than 60% of them are coming from the West. Uh, so the problem that I see here is that uh, I feel like there is kind of an hegemony of the West in setting what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in terms of development and use of artificial intelligence system, right? And this is a denying of the diversity of cultural perspective on what is acceptable and what is not. Uh, when we talk about ethics, I mean, here in France or in the West, most uh, of the time we think about the three main theories that we are using, consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics, right? But if you go to some other places in the world, they don't have the same mindset. They don't have the same cultural background. They don't even think about the ontology, Kantian deontology. Emmanuel Kant is not uh, at the core of the, the, the philosophical thinking, for example, in Asia, right? You, you should definitely adjust uh, to those to those cultural um, uh, backgrounds in order to see if it is acceptable or not acceptable. Then in that big framework, trust is a really interesting point too, because most of the time trust is poorly defined as well. We don't know trust what trust is exactly. Uh, you've certainly heard about the fact that the European Union is trying to develop what we call trustworthy AI, right? Uh, making sure that AI will be trustable. Uh, that doesn't make sense because sociologically speaking, actually trust can be only given to individuals, human beings. You cannot trust a technology. You will trust the people that are behind the technology that have developed it or that are using it. But you cannot trust technology per se because technology is not enough autonomous to have intentions. So uh, in your question, the big issue that we have is the words that we are all using all the time, trust, ethics, artificial intelligence. And I should add, uh, just to finish on that, the word universal, right? Because here in the West, we do believe that we have universal values, that we share values, that we have common, uh, common ideas about what is acceptable, acceptable and what is not. But the point is that there is no such universal values. You can have values that will be shared by big part of the world or all around the globe, but you don't have, we don't have so far, we have not been able to define any kind of universal values. 
So this quest uh, for, for trust, I think it's not ethically acceptable, partly because it denies the diversity of perspective that we can that we can uh, meet in in the in the in the world lots of people would say that and especially uh, regarding cybersecurity that trust is not a value distrust is a value vigilance is a value right because you want to make sure that the uh, the, the system that you're using will not be a threat to you right so depending on your perspective depending on your perceptions of the threat depending on your culture trust can be a value or it cannot be a value right so depending on that it will be I think it'll be acceptable or not. Thank you, doctor. Exactly what you mentioned is a valid point that where can build the trust by using this technology? With AI, there is our uh, diversity of culture, how to accept such solution or such a, a future. AI is a wild uh, technology. It's an umbrella for other that technology such like machine learning, deep learning, we are dealing today with big data. So how we can give the trust for such technology to make a, a decision and prediction uh, of our uh, uh, direction where we are going. So thank you for this input. So uh, I would like to forward the second question here uh, uh, to Madame Hala. But uh, Hala, as you know, you are coming from banking background. Okay, and today, as you notice, we are living in a, a pandemic, okay, uh, everywhere where remote work has become essential for us, okay, uh, especially when you are dealing with banking uh, services from uh, funded transfer, uh, uh, opening accounts. Uh, today, we find that banks are uh, doing uh, in, like competitions between them, how we can give a streamlined service to the end user through online products, uh, digital banking come today. Uh, we have a, a chatbot. So from security perspective, how we can secure these channels, how we can secure uh, uh, customer accounts, uh, their transaction, how we can build on the top of that, uh, the zero trust system. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Rami. Uh, actually, the zero trust is uh, not uh, a new concept in the banking industry. Uh, I consider the banking industry as a mature industry in the cybersecurity uh, because we are treating our clients' uh, data and information in a more secured manner, and it's uh, required by a different regulators across different countries. Um, so uh, we do not provide, let's say, uh, access uh, to a system uh, for everyone. Uh, we give it uh, based on uh, a need basis and we give it uh, based uh, in a principle least privileges uh, and just uh, to uh, perform a specific function. Assume we want to uh, do a transfer uh, transaction, we do not allow one user to uh, conduct uh, the transaction from end to end. We are separating this like maker checker, uh, different user uh, doing uh, different things. Uh, how to use it now with the zero trust? Now, I think zero trust, it will be uh, more used uh, for enhancing the modern work work uh, place uh, since from uh, COVID-19 situation it has been introduced so uh, we noticed that most of employees they are working remotely so they are not connected to the LAN network to access uh, the systems uh, they are connected uh, to the internet uh, they need to access a VPN connection in order to be connected to the internet then access uh, let's say the bank systems um, and uh, also for uh, the clients, um, it's providing, uh, let's say, uh, it's uh, the zero trust, it's uh, supporting digital uh, products and uh, security. Um, because it's, it's making this uh, more secured, like it it's uh, checking um, the profile for the client, uh, the behavior for the client, uh, let's say the operating system they are using, uh, machines, uh, location uh, where they are exist. Um, how, let's say, if, in case they are uh, performing a transaction, usually uh, what is the amount of the transaction they are uh, performing? Uh, what is their behavior in, um, in, in accessing or conducting any transaction uh, through the digital uh, channels in the bank. Uh, 
Uh, so zero trust, it has uh, a lot of uh, benefits for banking industry and non-banking industry. In banking industry, it's uh, something uh, common uh, used. We validate any access before granting the access. Uh, and also we are verifying uh, different things like we are verifying the identity, verifying the device used to access, uh, verify the access itself, uh, verify the service, um, the applications and all these things. Thanks. Uh, I would like to add here uh, one more note, okay. Uh, uh, do you feel security is uh, hanging or, strict, uh, or making uh, some strict reliability of uh, daily services? Uh, security, it's it's a must for the banking industry. It's a must. If you do not have the security, then you will not be able to compete in the market uh, because your clients, they are depending uh, in your uh, security system. Um, their money, it's uh, secured. Uh, no one can uh, perform a transaction on their behalf. So they are reliable on uh, the bank's uh, channels, uh, security controls and all these things. And that is why uh, the clients take a decision to, um, let's say, join a specific bank or not. Thank you, Hala, for your input. So it's a valid point that security is mandatory, especially when we are dealing with such services like banking industries. Okay, uh, where today we find uh, uh, many technology from blockchain, uh, AI, is implemented in the top of these uh, services, banking services, to secure this channel. So security is becoming a man. Okay, not a restrictions. So this ethics and this culture shall be adopted. Okay, uh, in, in the organization itself uh, to implement the right uh, foundation uh, with their services in secure way. So thank you for input. Uh, Shadi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you too? You are welcome. Shadi, you are the one here who was the pressure service provider. Okay. So once here, okay, uh, you are dealing with the client and the customer, uh, providing uh, uh, a solution, reliable solution for them. Um, uh, encourage the motivation to transform their existing business process to more flexible. Uh, to be more uh, uh, reliable in their uh, daily uh, life. So here, from point of view, how do you feel, okay, zero trust is important uh, for customer to secure their end user application, especially today we are working from uh, remotely and become now a, a lifestyle now. I don't think we are going back uh, to the regular uh, office attendance or regular meetings. So today, everything is becoming virtual, remotely, uh, from any device, any apps. So how I can build a, a zero trust on the top of that and secure these channels? Sure. And this is our new norm that all of us should be um, adapting with. The new norm of the uh, remote work, the new norm of the virtual access, for our application, either it's an on-prem, it's on the cloud. And this is how the zero trust approach is coming to the picture. It is not related to the certain industry. I have worked on all the mix and match for industries. Then each and every industry has its own use cases, its own target and focal points, but all of them are sharing the common concept of the zero trust approach. Zero trust approach means never trusting, always checking. You need to always keep checking on the things, either you are connecting to your on-prem applications, hybrid or fully cloud. The solution that should be provided should be covering all of this. And you should be giving the flexibility for the customers to put their data, whether they decide. They need to put it on-prem, hybrid, cloud, their application as a SaaS model, whatever they are. And that's what Citrix is focusing on as well for helping our customers in. And our zero trust approach, which is the main concept that Aura is dealing with, I believe it's dealing with three main aspects. First of all is the device verification. I have to make sure that the device which is being used to enter the environment is verified and up to my security levels and my up to my security uh, 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 policies. 
This is by endpoint analysis to be done. This is by the checking that need to be done to the device before it's entering the environment. The other way around is the user identity. User identity is one of the most important things that I don't rely only on the uh, username and password from the Active Directory. I should be adding to it two-factor authentication, either the one-time password, either the smart card, either the login, either what are the options agent Active Directory on AWS, you can have to deal with all of them. The third part, which is the most important part as well, is the content security. Whenever I'm having the user now, I verify his device. And then I make sure that this is my user that is logging. Now coming to his working on production, I have to make sure that I'm securing the data that he's working on. And here is coming the content security. Content security can be done all over products. But the main concept of here, I need to make sure that there is no data leakage happen. There is no security threat uh, uh, um, uh, affecting badly on my environment by giving, for example, anti-key logging and anti-screen capturing software, uh, uh, secure web access uh, platforms, SASE protocols. I have to give, for example, session recording, session watermarking, contextual access, analytics part, which is the most important things that is giving us the visibility from end to end on the security layer and the performance layer as well. So the secure, the, the, the zero trust approach is dealing with the three main aspects, device verification, user identity, and content security. And this is what actually Citrix is focusing on. And we are coping with all our partners and all our vendors that are we having a partnership with this, either it's fully on-prem as I mentioned, or on the cloud with Azure, with AWS, with Google, with Oracle. That's what we are dealing to give the customer the flexibility to maintain the user experience and to make sure that we are adding on, on of it the top level of security. Yes, Shadi, thanks. And uh, from your perspective, okay, uh, uh, updating the remote users, as you know, when they are outside of the premise itself or outside from the cloud. So today we are using more tablets, okay, mobile systems. So how I can make sure they are up to date, they are trustable, that I am dealing not with a device as this, I'm dealing with identity. As you mentioned, identity protection. So how I can to reach to that level so I can make sure that zero, zero trust is in place? Yes. Perfectly, it's a perfect question that it usually we are usually thinking about that how I'm making sure that my sensor user identity, the device is checking and it's an up to date. That's what I'm telling you, we have two terms, the bring your own device term that the user can use his own devices. So maybe we are not somehow care about the device that using, but what we care is about is meeting the policy that I'm allowing that's entering him the environment. And this is, can be done easily by the gateway service that we are providing, SASE, software, uh, secure web access, or even our endpoint management. We can provide an endpoint management solution for managing the device itself, for managing the application that be pushed on the device. So we are having here an end-to-end -end solution, starting from the user itself, wherever he's locating, from any location, from any device, in order to allow him to access any application, whether it's a data center, on the cloud, on a private cloud, it doesn't matter. We need to provide this with the high user experience, with the high security level structure. Thanks, Shadi. Valid point. So uh, I would like to go back uh, to Dr. Emmanuel. Okay. Uh, AI is the future now. Okay, where we need to relay in the technology uh, to streamline the process, to streamline uh, our daily uh, life, okay? Uh, especially when we talk about uh, organization itself, uh, process automation, uh, give the system uh, the ability and the trust uh, to make such decision, uh, such implementation. So, from your point of perspective, is here uh, there is a conflict of interest between AI and the security itself? Uh, the first thing that I want to stress is that um, I, I would not say that there is a conflict of interest between AI and anything, right? Once again, um, AI 
is is still a tool, right? It's 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 really well developed, and then I was I was saying it's poorly defined, but it's not autonomous enough uh, to be considered as a full agent, right? So the conflict of interest uh, must not be uh, between AI or, or, or any uh, other other system. Uh, the point with with uh, with AI systems is that. Uh, we we are not knowing exactly where we're going, right? And and so there is this need of trust because there is a high level of uncertainty about about AI the way it is used, right? It's exactly what has been said by the two uh, other esteemed speakers uh, about cybersecurity and the zero trust framework, right? When there is uncertainty, there is threat, and where there's where there is threat, you must be vigilant. So zero trust is considered as a virtue, is considered as a value uh, in, in, in that specific case. Uh, the point that we have with artificial intelligence is that we really need people, and especially here in the West, we need people to trust AI because we want to sell them AI products. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about this phrase by Thomas Metzinger. Uh, he was a member of the commission's expert who worked on the trustworthy AI for the European Union and the left. Uh, saying, quote, the trustworthy AI story is a marketing narrative invented by industry, a bedtime story for Thomas customers, uh, end quote. It means that artificial intelligence is mainly seen as, uh, a, 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 a trustworthy AI story is mainly seen as a communication tool, right? As a marketing tool, much more of the reality. Once again, the, 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 the mistake that we are all making, I guess, is to reify artificial intelligence as if it exists for real and as it if it was kind of a full autonomous agent and, uh, on which you can you know give trust and uh, that can be responsible that can be flexible that can be this or that uh, we really have to refocus our thoughts on individuals that are behind those systems, right? When it comes to uh, conflict of interest, we have to see who is developing the system, who is using it, who is selling it, for what purposes, right? Not the system itself, not artificial uh, intelligence itself, but the people that are behind that, right? Uh, because the problem that we have now is that all this ethical narrative that we've built, which is what I called cosmetics, which is here only to hide the reality of things, which is AI is a big market, you have huge promises financially, commercially, diplomatically behind AI, right? We all want our lion's share of artificial intelligence, but in some places like in the West, we are hiding our real gold behind a veil of, uh, of let's say, ethicality, right? Or, or acceptability uh, by ethical standards, right? So the point is that we really need to understand that AI per se, is not an agent. We have to focus on the individuals that are using it, the consumers, the people that are selling, the people that are programming, the people that are designing AI systems. Yes, exactly. And here uh, it's come, come to uh, a point of mine, uh, uh, as I've been in many events talking about AI, is the, the question here, it's coming to my mind always, uh, is artificial intelligence can be one day to be artificial traits? For example, we see today deep fake, okay? That's we can produce a face moving, okay? Uh, using the original inputs, uh, same thing with face recognition, voice uh, recognition, we can duplicate that. So I find many areas, they using this uh, intelligence to convert it to the traits. Okay, as you know, this is a human nature, whereas this diversity of nature to accept such AI ethics has become a problem. Okay, so the culture of the human or misusing technology has become a threat itself. So what, what do you feel in the coming, the future of AI in, in coming 10 years? Oh, that's, that's, that's a really difficult uh, uh, oh. job to, to do, obviously, to, to try to foresee what will happen. I, I don't truly really know. The, what what I, I want to stress here, which is really important, is that I've heard a lot of things about, don't think about uh, AI as a threat that's science fiction, right? Um, my point is that it's not science fiction. Even if the probability that at some point AI could become a threat to humankind uh, for any reason by any means, even if the probability is really low, we had we have now to think about it right now. 
right right now even if if it's once again a really low probability and we can ex we cannot exclude it we cannot exclude the possibility that ai can represent a threat but this threat will depend on who is assessing the threat obviously depending on your culture depending on your geopolitical environment depending on your philosophical background your political systems the threat will not be assessed the same way uh, as for other places other countries other cultures right so uh, in some places, and for for example, if you look at the animist culture, uh, technology is not a threat. is not seen as a threat, right? The relation to robots, the the, the, the relation to technology, uh, is is much easier than it is in the West, right? The reluctance to use those systems uh, is less important than the, the one that we are facing here in the West. So, for some people. AI is seen as kind of a panacea, the, the, the best solution to live a better life, right? To be freed from pain, freed from suffering, uh, even freed from death. And from, for other, it would be a threat in, in the sense that at some point it could replace human beings, right? So I don't know how it will go. I know that there are lots of work that are being, doing, being done uh, currently on artificial intelligence in many, many fields. Obviously it can become a threat. But once again, uh, it will depend on who is assessing this kind of threat. Yes, thanks, you. And that's why uh, now security products become more intelligent, okay, by understanding the behavior, okay, uh, who's behind the system or who behind uh, who are using the system itself. Uh, today, I see uh, emails sending from uh, US. In two minutes, it's been sent from uh, uh, UK, for example. So this far distance, how come? So that's why become more intelligent, our security product. This is where we need to use AI also in security. Okay, this is traits to so have visualized about this traits. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I'll get, I'll come back uh, to Hala. Okay. Uh, you, you discussed about zero trust in banks or in, or in general how it is important so implementing such solutions security solutions uh, zero trust specifically uh, is there any barriers for implementation obstacles you are facing during the implementation yeah uh, actually, there is no one single uh, application can be used to provide you with uh, a zero trust uh, solution. So we are having uh, a challenge for incomplete solution. Uh, no vendor provide end-to-end -end, uh, solution for uh, zero trust, which leads uh, sometimes to integration issues uh, between the solutions uh, provided. Uh, this is um, uh, very important because, let's say, for um, for authentication or multi-factor authentication services, it can be uh, prov uh, provided by a different vendor uh, who is providing um, a threat uh, algorithm uh, or a policy uh, to the organization. Um, you need to, to understand how uh, those uh, systems integrated together, uh, what is um, the shortage in each uh, system or what is the issues and how to come over uh, these things. Um, also, uh, having end-to-end -end, uh, visibility, it's required uh, for uh, to implement uh, a zero trust. And maybe one organization, uh, one sorry, um, one vendor, uh, he, he might not uh, understand uh, the full process, let's say, uh, for for a transaction in order to identify uh, what needs to be identified, which systems must be uh, there, what what system talking to which other systems. Because because um, let's say in banking industry, we are not using uh, one system to perform uh, the full, full transaction. You need to work on a different uh, applications. Um, in case you are, let's say, implementing uh, network segmentations uh, for the applications, you need to understand uh, how it works together, which user has access to uh, which system and all these things. Exactly. So there is no one system, as you mentioned, have the full control. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you believe that uh, user awarenesses or user itself is a tool itself that by user taking the right prevention, 
He has awarenesses for the existing policies. Uh, as you know, for ISO 27001, we have uh, about uh, 14 domains uh, to be secured. Okay, so most of them, they are not a tools to implement these policies and security. There, there are some domain can be protected by tools and control and some not, depend on the user itself. So how important user knowledge and user behavior can support the zero trust? Uh, this is very important because al always we are saying that the human is the weakest factor in the information and cybersecurity. Uh, no matter uh, how many control you are implementing, um, how solutions, uh, how many solution you are also uh, adapting in your uh, organization, if you have uh, insider uh, a threat, then you will be, let's say, under under a threat. Um, so uh, learning and education for the employees, it's very, very important, not only for employees, also for your clients. Uh, how to deal securely, uh, like uh, do not share your, um, your in personal information, like a driving license information, passport uh, details, uh, the, uh, your uh, ID uh, details, uh, because uh, let's say uh, you want to update your uh, information, so you might be re required to uh, answer some questions uh, related to the person. So if you are providing these details for anyone, uh, then they might um, conduct a fraudulent transactions uh, on, on your uh, behalf or uh, they can, let's say, uh, ask uh, for uh, a specific in, uh, details about your records, your uh, account details, all, the, all these things. So training and awareness, it's very important for employees, for clients, uh, for, let's say, um, admin um, uh, staff and uh, the employees who is dealing with a privileged identity or they have uh, access to the privileged uh, accounts. Okay. And this is where the employee or the end user play factor in this one, how he should be uh, well educated about uh, the threats around, uh, okay, uh, updated with the uh, uh, latest uh, 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 vulnerabilities, okay, he should not relay all the time in the uh, system itself, he said, okay, I have anti malware or antivirus, I am secured, I can do whatever, so knowledge base is very important here uh, to uh, collaborate between humans sense and the, the system sense, so we can strengthen uh, this channel. Uh, thank you, Hala, for input. Uh, Shadi, uh, I, I think you are running a bit uh, out of time, but it's as useful information. Uh, so Shadi, today you know uh, the data is everywhere, okay? We have it uh, in the cloud, uh, on-premise, hybrid, some information is stored in the uh, mobility devices. So information everywhere. So this has become a challenge, okay, for us, how to secure uh, this information, how to detect the rest. So here, do we have uh, a decent system can give us a, a visuality, okay, and visualize these traits and what the right action to be taken again these traits yes definitely this is the very important question because um, now analytics and end-to-end -end visibility is not a complement a complementary package anymore it's a mandate to be have the, the the three main factors of any successful end user computing solution should be sure the virtualization part definitely the networking part but it should be completed by the analytics part, which is giving you the end-to-end -end visibility on the all layers of your environment, starting from the user, from the applications, from the networking side, from the user consumption. That's why how Citrix is concentrating specifically about this analytics part, we are providing the analytics into two of these three main areas, the security part, the performance part on tracking the virtual machines, tracking the, 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 the usage of the system, and as well as the productivity regarding the license, regarding the asset management, regarding how many users, which application they are using. So it gives you the end-to-end -end visibility. This is not only. We added on top of this as well, the integration with the machine learning and the AI. 
because we don't need only to generate insights, we don't need only to generate reportings, we don't need to only to generate tables, this is most important, but as well as we need to add an automated actions. We need the machine learning to study the user behavior, to study what's happening there, and then take automatic actions to these users. For example, if we have a user that is suddenly starting to download a lot of documents, suddenly to access from a location that is not used to access from, how I'm be responding to it? And if he's doing this at the night, do I need an admin to be a way to do that action? No, that's what the machine learning or the artificial intelligence for the analytics is taking part for taking an automatic actions on such behaviors. Maybe blocking the access, maybe monitoring him, enable session recording on him, stopping him from downloading documents. A lot of automated actions can be adjusted to be taken. So it is not, as I mentioned, a complementary anymore. It's a mandating for showing up reports, analytics, giving you the end-to-end -end visibility, as well as using for taking automatic actions after studying the user behavior from this perspective. Exactly. And that's why threat intel uh, analytics is so important to study the threats from where uh, do the analytics uh, to make a decision uh, on security solution. Okay, sometimes the threats coming uh, to the same person at the same time or threats affect a, a, a file or a certain destination, okay, uh, multiple or twice time in the, in a, in a say in the short period. The threats can coming from anywhere. So studying a threat and have a visual image uh, uh, about this threat and how the separate behavior is so important to tune our system and implement the right solution, which can support the security goals. So uh, Naveen, if you are there, if I have a few minutes, I can end up the session with the last input from each panelist. Yes, certainly, uh, Mr. Rami. We have about four minutes. If you can, yes, summarize in a quick, uh, uh, you know, last minute note. That right? would be enough. That's that would be enough. So, uh, my decent uh, panelists, okay, if you can uh, give us a last input about security and how important security from point of view, and how we can improve our security future, okay, with uh, this is a huge transformation in our uh, digital life. So I'll start uh, with Dr. Manuel. Yeah, so just uh, briefly, I just want to um, uh, to say that uh, regarding safety, trust is definitely not a good, uh, a good solution and zero trust is definitely one of the, the greatest items that, we, uh, that we've seen so far. And just wanted to raise awareness about the words that we're using in all that because we're all using trust, zero trust, mistrust, distrust but we really need to know what we're talking about. So we need definitions and we need, and that's my last point, we need to contextualize those words in specific cultural backgrounds. Thank you. Hala? Thank you, Rami. Uh, actually, for uh, me, I want uh, to uh, encourage all organizations to uh, work uh, more in uh, zero trust. Um, I know it's uh, easier for uh, small companies or the modern uh, companies uh, to implement the zero trust. However, for the big companies uh, who have um, a legacy systems, uh, they can start. Uh, they can put a plan, identify their risk, uh, risk processes or uh, the processes that need to be moved to the digital or to the cloud, whatsoever, and to uh, implement uh, the security controls and work in the zero in the zero trust because it will um, manage the risk properly for them and uh, it will uh, provide them with uh, advantages um, and uh, to be um, to to compete in in a good way, let's say, in in the industry which they are working on. So it's a journey, and they need to start. Hopefully this journey finished. Yeah. Uh, Shadi? Yes, I will take it from what Hala mentioned. We need to start the zero trust is the starting point that we should starting with because this, the security is the main concern for all business nowadays. So starting point is the zero trust, complementing it by the analytics as well. 
as well as security efforts will not be ending. There is no 100% solution in giving you the end-to-end -end security. What all the entities need to focus on and concentrating is to following up the, the vendors and the efforts that keeping up scalable, flexible for new security threats, because each and every hour we have a new security threats. So we need to be adaptable, flexible for this. That's how from our side as a Citrix, and definitely we are learning from the companies and the sectors that we are dealing with, that how we adapt and should be flexible to integrate with any upcoming security threats. Thank you, Shadi. Uh, panelist, I really enjoyed uh, have conversation with you. It was really useful information how we can build our future security. Uh, technology is important. Technology is give us uh, a space where make our life easy, but security also is, is at top of that to secure uh, uh, this new lifestyle uh, where, where we are. So I would like to thank you again, and uh, I hope to see you in the nearest future. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Rami. So Yes, Ms. Hala. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you so much there, Ms. Rami, uh, Mr. Dr. Emanuel, and uh, Shadi, thanks so much for joining in. Of course, it was an interesting session. The audience have uh, uh, quite, I mean, they have quite uh, been quite, what do I say? Uh, there has been a few questions, of course, that has come up. But again, our next keynote presentation, um, you know, is, is from Manage Engine. So he's been waiting for the last 10 minutes. So I'll have to skip that and probably send it across to you all to, you know, uh, answer them on a, on a personal note. Of course, will be shared via email or WhatsApp group that you all are in. Yeah, thank you again thank so much for, for making you, the information. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Salah.